In the sleepy suburbs of Portland, Oregon, a second grader vanishes without a trace from his elementary school science fair. Despite numerous leads and countless man hours, Kyron Horman has never been found. Some believe he was abducted by a stranger. Others suspect someone he knew and trusted has something to do with his sudden disappearance. And to this day, his fate remains a mystery. But here's what we know. The Skyline School hosted a science fair on Friday, June 4th, 2010. The whole school was involved with hundreds of family and friends wandering through the classrooms, checking out the exhibits before classes started. Now, usually school policy required visitors to check in and out, but that day, the rules were lifted because of the special event. Kyron Horman was especially proud of his project. It was all about red-eyed tree frogs. Now, ironically, the frogs use their bulging red eyes and bright orange feet to startle predators and give themselves a few extra seconds to run away. And if only he could have done the same. With a little warning of the danger approaching with a few extra seconds to escape, maybe we wouldn't be telling the story at all. But that morning, he grinned for the camera in front of his project. It was the last picture he would ever take. At some point, not long after that, he disappeared. The person behind the lens was his stepmother, Terry Moulton Horman. She had helped him set up his project in his classroom the day before. And on that Friday morning, she and his baby half-sister hopped into his dad's white Ford F-250 truck and took him to school. He didn't always get a ride. Usually he rode the school bus, but families were invited for the first day of the science fair. When it came to family, Kyron's situation was complicated. Oh, his mother and father, Desiree and Kane, were married for about two years before she got pregnant with him. Not long after she got the news, she began to suspect that Kane was seeing another woman. A few months before Kyron was born, in September of 2002, she learned she was right. The woman he was stepping out with was Terry. As Desiree and the baby were moving out, Terry was moving in. Now, Kyron wasn't the only child in this blended family. He had an older half-brother from his mother's first marriage. Now, Terry had two previous husbands and a son from one of them. Kyron lived with Desiree and his older half-brother. But when he was about two, Desiree started treatment for some fairly serious ongoing kidney issues. So the problem was her doctor was in Canada. Originally, she planned to take her sons with her, but neither Kane nor her first husband would give their permission to take them out of the country. So she agreed to relinquish custody while she was being treated. It was meant to be a temporary solution, but you know what they say about the best laid plans. As she got better, the medical bills made her finances worse. And when she came back to the States a couple of months later, she was forced to move into her parents' house in Medford. That's about four and a half hours south of Portland where her sons were living. Now, meanwhile, Kane and Terry had tied the knot and she gave birth to their daughter. Her son lived with them too. Desiree's first husband was also remarried with children of their own, and his second wife and Terry bonded over their shared dislike of Desiree and their stepsons. Like I said, complicated. With all things considered, the family court decided to grant primary custody to the fathers so the boys could stay in Portland where they'd grown up. But Desiree saw her sons regularly as she was rebuilding her life in Medford. That's where she met Tony, the man who had become Kyron's stepfather. Now, he was a detective in the Medford Police Department. And she, Desiree, was working in the fraud department of a local bank. And he was the detective assigned to the cases that she passed on to the Medford Police Department. Kyron loved him. In fact, he wanted to grow up to be a detective just like him. And on the day he vanished, he was wearing his beloved CSI t-shirt. That morning, Terry, her baby girl, and Kyron got to Skyline shortly after 8 a.m. Desiree couldn't get the time off work to make the trip up, and Kane, who worked as a software engineer at Intel, he was also stuck at the office. So Terry and his little sister were the only family with him at the school that day. He left his jacket and backpack in his classroom, and together the three of them walked around to check out the other science exhibits. At some point, Terry snapped the now infamous picture of him in front of his red-eyed frog display. And the next thing anyone knows for sure is that Kyron wasn't at his desk when his teacher took attendance at 10 a.m. 
But his coat and backpack stayed where he had hung them up that morning, and the school day went on as usual. Around 2 p.m., Kane got home from work. Terry and his daughter were already at the house. At 3.15, the little family walked down to the corner to meet Kyron at his bus stop, but he didn't get off the school bus. He had never even gotten on it. His teacher hadn't been alarmed to see his seat empty that day. He had a doctor's appointment. Terry had told her so. That's how she remembers it. But according to Investigation Discovery, Terry says the teacher got it wrong, and the appointment was actually scheduled for the following Friday. Kyron was six hours missing before the first alarm was raised. At 3.46, the school dialed 911. By 4.30, a massive search was underway, and efforts continued through the night. Now, Skyline is a rural school surrounded by rolling hills and forest. Surveillance cameras were something for bigger schools with bigger budgets. They didn't have any, not then anyway. So there was no way to see if the seven-year-old had slipped out a side door or walked out the front. There was no hard and fast proof to say who he left with, if anyone. Now, according to Rebecca Morris, author of a book about this case called Boy Missing, When Desiree and Tony got to Portland that night, the scene at the house was chaotic, but Terry seemed to be doing her best to stay upbeat and keep things as normal as possible. She was even doing laundry, and among the pieces she threw into the wash were the jacket and backpack Kyron had so carefully hung up in his classroom that very morning. In contrast to his wife's upbeat demeanor, Kane was red-eyed and shocked. He was also wired literally. The well-wishers around them didn't know it at the time, but detectives had loaded him up with listening devices so they could hear the conversations going on in the house. You see, Kyron was a sweet but shy boy. He wasn't the type to skip class and chase adventure, and a thorough search of the school grounds and the area around it had turned up nothing. So without officially naming anyone as a suspect, it was clear that investigators were looking at the family and their close friends. So Desiree, Tony, Kane, and Terry were asked to take polygraphs. According to Boy Missing, Desiree said her test consisted of three crucial questions. Do you know what happened? Do you know where he is? Did you do something to him? And her only answer was no. She passed. Everyone passed. Well, everyone except Terry. She was told she failed twice, and she walked out during a third try. With the family's other alibis confirmed, investigators were very curious about the last moments that Terry had with Kyron and where she went after she left Skyline. So Desiree, Tony, and Kane were also wondering where exactly she'd been that day. Navigating the fragile boundaries of a blended family is precarious in the best of times, but the Horman Youngs thought that they had it pretty well figured out. Every third weekend, Desiree and Kane met at a spot between Medford and Portland to drop off and pick up Kyron. And same with her other husband and her other son. But we're just talking about Kyron here. Okay. So Kyron spent a lot of his summers with his mother and stepfather. And mostly Terry and Desiree didn't talk. Terry grew up an only child in Oregon. She had a degree in education. And she worked as a substitute teacher off and on. Then she got really into bodybuilding. She even came in fourth in a competition. In 2005, according to Oregon Live, she pleaded guilty to reckless endangerment for driving under the influence while her 11-year-old biological son was in the car, and she devoted herself to being a stay-at-home mom. But the gym was still an important part of her life, and it plays a key role in this story, too. Detectives say she was the last person to see Kyron that morning, and the people at her gym were the last ones to see her before everything went sideways. So that afternoon, author Rebecca Morris learned that Terry had been chattier than normal. She emailed Desiree a few times, asking about summer plans, school stuff, letting her know that she'd posted pictures from the science fair to Facebook. That morning, around 8.45 a.m., she said she last saw Kyron walking down the hall toward his classroom. From school, she went to a Fred Meyer grocery store. Security cameras caught her leaving around 9.15. From there, she went to a second Fred Meyer. She said she was trying to find a specific type of cold medicine for her baby daughter. Again, CCTV confirmed she was there, and she left around 9.45. Her next confirmed location was her gym. She was there sometime between almost noon and half past. She only stayed a few minutes, just long enough to talk to a few other members. One woman later claimed she saw a nasty cut on her leg. According to author Rebecca Morris, 
Terry said it was from a weightlifting accident, and by 1.20, she was home, logging into Facebook to post that morning's photos. But detectives were most curious about the time Terry couldn't account for with witnesses or CCTV. They wanted to know where she went between Fred Meyer and the gym. And she says she was just driving, winding her way around backcountry roads, letting the motion of the truck soothe her baby daughter. So the girl had an earache and she couldn't settle. So Terry said driving helped put her to sleep. She certainly wasn't the only person investigators were digging into. Sex predators in the area were questioned. People the family knew and trusted were looked at. Extended family was checked. Visitors to the school before and after the day of the science fair were followed up on. And employees of the school were investigated and ultimately cleared. Thousands of tips and leads were tracked and crossed off, and the sheriff's department asked for and got assistance from the FBI and law enforcement up and down the West Coast. It quickly became one of the largest missing person searches in local history. But Chiron had somehow vanished without a trace. On the 10th day gone, the case was reclassified as a criminal investigation, and by all appearances, their focus was fixed on one person, Terry. The sheriff's office released a flyer asking the community for tips, and on the flyer was Kyron's picture along with the picture of Terry and the truck she was driving the day he went missing. Now, real quick, that truck is a little odd because she had a red Mustang that she loved, that she always drove, and she never really borrowed her husband's truck, but on that day, she did. The students and parents of Skyline were also given a questionnaire asking them if they saw Kyron, Terry, or Terry's truck she was driving that day, and if so, when and where. But she wasn't charged with anything. She didn't even rise to person of interest level, not officially. So the community was left to wonder why the police were so interested in her whereabouts. Now from the outside, she seemed to be a good mom. There was no indication anything was wrong. You had to look a little closer to see why detectives were keeping an eye on her. Now, just days before he vanished, she'd been sending emails complaining about her little stepson. The exact words she used haven't been revealed, but according to interviews that Desiree gave Investigation Discovery, it appeared that Cain may have been stepping out on Terry, and Terry seemed to blame Kyron for her marriage unraveling. And it wasn't just her suspicions about Cain that were upsetting. A few months before Kyron disappeared, her biological son went to live with other family members. The reasons behind the move aren't totally clear, but she definitely was not happy about it. And the night before everything went sideways, detectives say that she emailed a friend that she was planning to leave and take her daughter with her. Now that night, she and Kane argued into the wee hours, and the next morning, her stepson vanished. Following her cell phone pings and what cameras and witnesses they could dig up, detectives tracked her movements to a cell tower near a remote area called Savi Island. It's about six miles from the school, but it might as well be an entire world away. It's thousands of acres of isolated fields and marshes where the area's rivers meet on their way to the Pacific Ocean. But an extensive search of the area turned up nothing. Of course... Maybe that's because there was nothing to find. Because if you were to travel the same distance on the opposite side of that cell tower, you would find yourself near the back roads close to the Horman house, near the area where Terry said that she was aimlessly driving, but not necessarily close to the gym where she ultimately ended up that day. And parents, help me here. If you got your child to sleep and she had a cold or an earache, would you then take her to a gym daycare? so you could sort of kind of not really even work out? Her long and winding drive was odd, but that's all that they really knew for sure. Three weeks after he went missing, something shocking happened, but it had nothing to do with Kyron, or did it? As it turned out, the little boy wasn't the only person Terry wanted out of her life. A landscaper went to the cops with this bombshell of a story. So about five months before Kyron vanished, Terry allegedly told him that she wanted her husband dead. He claims she asked him if he would do it or knew someone who would. He says that she was willing to pay $10,000 to anyone who would get rid of Cain for her because, in her words, he was abusing her. Or, you know, so he said that she said. 
So with this new twist, the police figured, hey, this is our chance to charge her with something, maybe even use it as leverage to get more information about Kyron's disappearance, assuming that she had anything to offer. So they set up a sting with this guy and an undercover officer, but she didn't take the bait. Instead, she flipped the script and turned them both into the police, saying he was blackmailing her because she wouldn't sleep with him. And then things got even stranger. Because when the police told Kane his wife allegedly wanted him dead and she'd asked their former landscaper to do it, he was totally confused. Not only was he shocked by this fresh hell, but he had no idea who the landscaper was. According to Investigation Discovery, as far as he knew, they had never hired the man to do any work for them. One thing he knew for sure, he was not safe in that house with Terry. So in early July 2010, he filed for divorce and a restraining order. Are you with me so far? This is like three weeks after their son disappeared. But not everyone believed that Terry was dangerous. When Kane took their baby daughter and moved out of their home, a girlfriend of Terry's moved in for like 11 days. Her name was Dee Dee Spiker. And it didn't take long for her to become a part of the investigation. According to police, quoted in Oregon Live and other reports, her activities on the day that Kyron vanished had some strange parallels to Terry's. So she worked as a gardener, and on that Friday, she was at work prepping for a garden show the next day. But between 11-ish and 1, her co-workers say she was nowhere to be found. That was about the same period of time when Terry was unaccounted for. They told police that they tried calling her in for lunch. They all got together for lunch every day. It was like this cute tradition, but there was no answer from her. They tried her cell, but again, no answer. The timing was truly bizarre, but is that all it was, just a coincidence? She explained that she'd left her phone in her truck and she was caught up in the work she was doing, and for some reason or another, she just didn't hear anyone calling her on the grounds that day. But it was coincidental enough for police to update their missing persons flyer and the questionnaire to include a picture of Dee Dee along with Terry and Kyron. And according to Oregon Live, they passed it around asking people if anyone had seen either woman between 9.45 a.m. and 1 p.m. on June 4th. Meanwhile, Dee Dee wasn't the only one keeping Terry company. Oh, yes. Just days after her alleged murder for her hire plot was exposed and Kane filed for divorce, she started sexting a man Kane knew from high school. So her messages caught the attention of detectives for a couple of reasons. Originally, the issue was an alleged violation of the restraining order. It's complicated, but basically she wasn't supposed to be sharing the details, and she did. As the central figure in a missing persons case, you'd expect her to realize everything she said would be examined for clues, and she did. She even got a burner phone so detectives couldn't listen in, and so did her friend Dee Dee, which came with its own questions. But it was the tone of Terry's messages to this man that really sent up red flags. They were of the X-rated variety. The police told Kane about them because they were worried that she might be trying to find a new Patsy since the last guy didn't work out. And they might have been onto something because this man admitted to photographing the address where Kane and his daughter were staying and looking up the location online. It sounded ominous, considering, but this guy claims it didn't and wouldn't have gone farther than an internet search. In any case, the restraining order kept her away from Kane and her daughter. And by the end of July, Terry had moved away from Portland and back to her parents' house in Southern Oregon. That is where the case stalled for the next two years. And then in 2012, Desiree filed a civil lawsuit against Terry, accusing her of kidnapping her son and demanding that she tell them where his body was. It was meant to force Terry to testify under oath, but it it didn't go as well as she hoped. She made it clear that, Terry made it clear, that she would plead the fifth and not say a word. And the police weren't thrilled about the lawsuit either because they could have been forced to hand over their investigation files. And that would mean any leads they were holding on to would have been public. So before it well and truly got underway, Desiree dropped the suit. But the following year, in 2013, she and Kane appeared on Dr. Phil to talk about the case. And according to the show's transcript published in Boy Missing, a few more behind-the-scenes details came out. Like, when she was asked why she thought Terry might have done something to Kyron, Desiree said she might have wanted to get back at Kane especially if he was cheating on her. Now, speaking of Kane, Dr. Phil also revealed that he had refused permission to searchers who wanted to comb through his property for any sign of his son. So, that's odd. 
By June of 2014, Terry and Kane's long divorce battle was officially final and he was granted full custody of their daughter. And a few weeks later, she tried to have her name changed to Claire Stella Sullivan. She didn't just pick that name out of a hat. There's meaning behind it. So according to writer Rebecca Morris, it's the name of a character in a novel that suspected of killing her husband and kids, but is later found to be innocent. Subtle. And a no-go. The judge denied her request, saying that as long as Kyron's case was unsolved, it was not in the public interest for her to change her name. But she managed it anyway. She did it the old-fashioned way. She got married again in March 2018. But two years before that, she took a turn on Dr. Phil's stage and blamed political corruption for making her the main focus of the investigation. And as for those failed lie detector tests, she says she's hard of hearing and didn't fully understand the questions. And she claims she was not the last person to see Kyron at the school. And she thinks a stranger took advantage of the school's chaotic science fair and walked in and grabbed him. Maybe even someone with a white truck, just like the one she'd been driving that day. And unfortunately, no one can say for sure if she's wrong or right. Because to this day, no charges have been filed against her or anyone. And Kyron has not been found alive or dead. Those two facts are very much connected. It's called a no-body crime. And the prosecution in Oregon does not want to charge anyone for his murder unless more concrete evidence turns up. They only get one shot at it. But if no one can say for sure that a murder actually occurred, then they could blow their chance. In his complete and total absence, there's nothing left behind but suspicions, speculation, and sadness. And that is your recap. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, it would mean so much to us if you would take a second to subscribe and tap that bell so you never miss a story. And hey, why not watch another recap right now? In the meantime, let's talk about this in the comments. What do you think happened to Kyron Horman that day? Until next time, see you soon.